I was gonna call today's episode Life on the D-List, and you know who, I guess, inspired this episode? Kathy Griffin. So Kathy Griffin used to have a show, I think, called Life on the D-List, all about her. This was like pre her life falling apart. I don't know why I was thinking about it, but I was thinking about it, and then I thought to myself, like, you know what would be a good episode is Life on the D-List, but like pertaining to cocktails. So like obscure cocktails that are still worth mixing, because there's a lot of classic cocktails that are really, they don't get a lot of play. Are these cocktails D-listers names you would recognize or are there like obscure ones? I mean, some of them are incredibly famous, mm. like incredibly famous and have really cool history behind them as well. If you just have a passing interest in cocktails, uh -huh. I'm not really sure that you're gonna like really have any name recognition, but that's why they're obscure because not many people make them, but they are worth drinking and like, much like actors and other pop culture media or like certain food dishes, sometimes cocktails get popular for really are arbitrary reasons. Like, I don't know if they're just too close to other cocktails or they're just like simple riffs or something, but they just never really captured the, the, the imagination of the public, you know? It's like when we did the Doritos margarita thing on Instagram, like instantly 700,000 people watched that because it's like, Doritos spirit is like, you know, novel, right? So there's got like, it's gotten that je ne sais quoi that you want in a video. Whereas like some of these cocktails are very close to other cocktails and they just might not have that oomph that throws them over the line like a mojito does or something. Right. You know, they just never really captured the imagination of the public, but I think that they should. And I think that that's unfair. So, you know, maybe this video will be an obscure barfly video that doesn't capture the imagination of the public, but that's okay. Today's episode is sponsored by Trade. Trade helps you make better coffee at home. It's a coffee subscription service that allows you to experience curated coffee just for you, delivered right to your door, when and how you want it every time. Trade sources the best coffee across the entire country and brings it right to your doorstep. They map very specific flavor preferences to hundreds and hundreds of different coffee flavor profiles so you get exactly what you want. And their technology pairs you with the best coffees around using art and science and marrying all of their industry expertise and machine learning. They built relationships with over 55 roasters nationwide so you can enjoy craft coffee from the comfort of your own home. And best of all, Trade roasts your coffee to order and delivers it exactly when and exactly how you need it. There are multiple ways to experience coffee with Trade, so go to drinktrade.com slash barfly or click the link in the description below for a free bag of coffee with select subscriptions. That's drinktrade.com slash barfly, or click the link in the description below to try one of their starter packs today. The obituary cocktail is a New Orleans riff on a martini, and it was created sometime in the 1940s at a cafe called Le Fitz Blacksmith Shop. There's a murky history about the cocktail. Like, we don't know who actually created it, but we do know a lot about Le Fitz. Le Fitz Blacksmith Shop, which you can find on the corner of Bourbon Street and St. Philip Street in the French Quarter in New Orleans, is one of the oldest surviving structures in that city. The story around the building was that a pirate and privateer by the name of John Le Fitz ran a business out of the house in the early 1800s. His brother was a blacksmith, and what they thought they would do was just run a smithy producing horseshoes as a cover. But the Lafitts were also known smugglers, and it's thought that the shop was used as a place to plot illegal seizure of goods and to smuggle contraband. It's known that the brothers operated a booming business smuggling contraband during the U.S. embargo on Great Britain in 1807. And quite honestly, there's all sorts of very interesting history about Jean Lafitte. He ended up helping out in the War of 1812 and became a spy, and then was was pardoned by the president. There's like all this cool stuff about Jean Lafitte. So now we're gonna fast forward to 1940s. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Roger Kaplinger that turned the now abandoned building into Cafe Lafitte. And it was here that the obituary cocktail was born. So before we get into actually mixing the thing, the obituary cocktail is a martini variation. And so therefore it uses gin and dry vermouth. And what makes this cocktail so fun is that although the original calls for a London dry gin, you can always use other gins because gins contain a proprietary blend of botanicals. And so when you change out the vermouth and you change out the gin, you can create really nice combinations. If you want something more botanical, if you want something more citrusy, then you can switch out your ingredients to create something awesome. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is grab our uh, mixing glass, which I have wanted to bat around lately. I don't know why. Okay, we're gonna grab our mixing glass. We're gonna do six dashes of absinthe, half an ounce of dry vermouth of your choice. I am using Dolan. 
two and a half ounces of gin. In this handy dandy jigger, I can pour it all the way to the top because that is the two and a half ounce mark. Let's crack our first cube. And then we're gonna add in some bigger pieces of ice. Give it a stir. And I think I'm gonna try a new technique today. Uh, we're gonna have a little a lemon twist on this. I'm gonna try something new with it though. So you wanna stir this down for a good long while because we wanna bring it down as close to equilibrium as we can. We're gonna grab our glass here. I like to get a nice long twist here. Okay, ready? So when you pour long, yeah, you wanna go up like this and then you wanna raise it as you pour so that you are not pouring it on the desk. Well, I meant to say like cutting board or table, but uh, I said desk. There we go. Did it aromatize though? Is that like a thing or do they just do it for style points? That's what I wanna know. It was oh like, no, it, oh yeah. But it spritzed a lot. Yeah, it's good though, yeah, I like it. What shape should I cut this time, Marius? Not the parallelogram. Why? Why do you hate the parallelogram so much? It's just boring. You're such a parallelogram hater for some reason, but I don't, I don't know why. How about something like that? We'll do like a little, like, like a flag. I don't know if there's enough of this to twirl around, but we'll see. It's a very thick lemon peel and sometimes it's hard to like keep it twirled on the side of the glass. But... Well, that looks kind of nice, right? Cute. Cheers. That is a lot of lemon. And you know what? The lemon goes swimmingly well with the absinthe. But what's nice about this cocktail is how well balanced it is. You have the lemon that hits you right at the beginning, but all of the, the botanicals of the gin and the dry vermouth. But what's the piece de resistance is that absinthe gets this uh, reputation for only having a nice flavor, but it's a botanical blend as well. And so you have wormwood in there. Wormwood was the ingredient that made uh, like the French government, I guess the US government ban absinthe, right? Mm -hmm. But wormwood is also a main ingredient in vermouth, so much so that there is a argument that vermouth without wormwood doesn't qualify as vermouth. And I don't think vermouth was ever banned. Yeah. So they just banned the absinthe because of this one court case that happened where this one dude killed his family after drinking absinthe among other things and right. probably smoking opium at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, they never banned uh, uh, vermouth. Well, uh, absinthe was also like the drink of choice for all these like eccentric artists and stuff, right? So. Well, you're talking about the Belle Epoque time, yeah. Yeah, that was like uh, early 1900s. I mean, before that too, like all the Van Gogh and all the stuff. For so 18, like late late 1800s to early 19, yeah, that's true, yeah. But it was also banned at the time. You know, the US banned it. I actually don't know if France banned it, but I know the US banned it. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting that vermouth also contained wormwood and it was supposed to be this hallucinogenic, oh, the green fairy, but really, it was also in ver vermouth and nobody said a damn thing about it. There it is, the obituary cocktail. Go get it and you will also be happy like I am. So this next cocktail is just simply known as Pauline. But then I always get into this thing and I don't know if it's just because I think too much about these things. I think Marius, you are gonna tell me that I, I like think about this stuff too much, but when a cocktail is just simply called Pauline, it's really weird to like go to the bar and be like, can I have Pauline? So do you call it the Pauline or do you just call it Pauline? <laughs> Yeah, I would say like, it's one of those it, things. Like, I will get it. Can I get it? A uh, Pauline. Can I get a Pauline? Yeah. Oh yeah. I guess you could do that if you went to, went to the bar. But like, uh, I'm gonna uh, make a Pauline. But when I say thing, I want to talk about Pauline, right? But I say like, oh, Pauline was first published. But I can't say that because it just sounds weird. So I guess we'll just have to call it for the intents and purposes of this video. It is called The Pauline. So The Pauline was first published in Harry Craddock's The Savoy Cocktail Book in 1930. And it's kind of an upgraded lemon daiquiri, basically. That's all it is. This is one of those long forgotten cocktails that, you know, modern bartenders found and they went through a whole process of revitalization, changing out the rum. The original calls for white rum, which I think is a little boring. I like to make mine with Jamaican rum. That's what I'm gonna use. Uh, but you know what? This is a really good template to just play around with different rum blends if that's what you wanna do. Playing around with rum blends is really awesome and fun. So if you wanna like pull down, like if you wanna use white rum and then like cut that, cut in a little rum agricole, that would be cool. Or like you wanna cut some rum agricole into uh, Jamaican rum. Another thing I really like to do is cut gin into Jamaican rum. So do like an ounce and a half of Jamaican rum, half an ounce of gin. Or actually in this case, it would be one ounce of Jamaican rum, half an ounce of gin because uh, it's a one and a half ounce spec. So uh, these old cocktails kind of come with smaller specs, I guess. Um, but yeah, let's make it. That's enough jibber jabber, I guess. Mm -hmm. I did it again, I switched it again. 
Um, all right, I'm gonna put that over there. The switching thing's kind of freaking me out a little bit. It's like I've never done that. And then all of a sudden today, I just start, start switching things around. It's just weird. Why do you think that um, lemons like don't pop as much when you juice them as limes do? Oh, that one did. Did it? Mm -hmm. Of course, like the one time that it, I, I say that, it, it has to prove me wrong. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna do three quarter, no, uh, that's not true, actually. We got all sorts of things to do first. So we've gotta do two drops of 20% saline solution, which I guess you could just put that in after you made the cocktail, but I don't wanna forget the bitters. You're gonna do one dash of orange bitters. We are also gonna use the absinthe, but we're gonna rinse the glass with it. So then we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, half an ounce of rich simple syrup, and then we're gonna do an ounce and a half of Jamaican rum. So it's gotta go into Nick and Nora because it just doesn't have a lot of volume. So here we go. Let's grab some ice out. Fill up our tin here. You wanna put a good amount of ice in the tin. You don't wanna like overfill it. You want some, you know, room for aeration of ingredients, but don't skimp on the ice, you know what I mean? Good shake. And then we shall strain it. Look at that, even a little small for a Nick and Nora. And guess what? Forgot to rinse the glass with absinthe. We'll just go boop, boop. Can't believe I forgot that. Oh, let's not forget. We're gonna do a nutmeg garnish here. Cheers. What saves this from being such a boring old daiquiri is the absinthe and the nutmeg. Nutmeg providing a little bit of I know, kind of winter holiday spice. And then you've got the botanicals of the absinthe. It would be a lot more pronounced if I had rinsed the glass with absinthe the way I should have. When you guys make this at home, definitely rinse the glass. Do as I say, not as I do. Pauline. The Pauline. Even as far as classics go, The Widow's Kiss is old. It's actually one of the oldest. It made its debut in George Kapler's Modern American Drinks in 1895. And I'd say it belongs in the Manhattan category, but if you look at the build, it really doesn't fit. There's no vermouth and it comes in at under three ounces. It could be an old fashioned, except that it's served up and not on the rocks. So I guess really it just may be in that like elusive category of cocktail that are known as orphan drinks, like a cocktail that doesn't fit in any of the cocktail uh, root categories. The best of these, is the recipe that Jim Meehan reworked, which pulls the liqueurs down for a little bit more balance. But the spec that I'm doing today is going to be a little bit of a riff on that. We are gonna be using Applejack in this cocktail. So if you don't have Applejack, which is really just kind of American slang for apple brandy, you can use Calvados. Just try and use something in the VSOP kind of area. So first thing we're gonna do is grab our mixing glass because we are mixing this cocktail. So this drink is incredibly simple. We're just going to add a quarter of an ounce of Benedictine to our mixing glass, a quarter of an ounce of yellow chartreuse. And in a recent video I did, I talked about using Strega as a alternative to yellow chartreuse if you can't find it. And then also uh, Faccia Bruto had a yellow chartreuse alternative. I don't know if they still have it because I looked on their website and I didn't see it. I'm hoping it's still available and it wasn't like a limited edition thing, but if it was limited edition, hopefully they make some more. A quarter of an ounce of yellow chartreuse, I'm gonna go get the thing I forgot. And uh, Marius, oh, please remind me to buy more of this because it's it's getting kind of low. Half an ounce of cognac. I'm using the Pierre Ferrand 1840, which I like a lot. I guess we'll put that in there because it's kind of homeless now. And then we're gonna do an ounce and a half of Applejack. Uh, to use the bonded Applejack, but there is an 86 proof Applejack. And you gotta be careful when you're using Laird's because there is a Laird's Applejack that is Applejack mixed with a neutral spirit and you don't wanna get that. You either wanna get the bonded, which is just straight apple brandy, or you can do the 86 or Calvados, like I said earlier. Let's get some uh, icy poo. They add some ice, crack the first cube. I give it a stir, about 40 seconds, or until the outside of the glass frosts. And then, I guess we're gonna, this is also gonna go in a Nekonora style glass, but I think I'm gonna do a modern one for the old drink. I think that that's nice. And this drink doesn't get any garnish or anything. It's just straight up poured out into your Nick and Nora. Look at that. Perfect. Cheers. So good. 
It is a really nice blend of flavors. So you have the Applejack, it's a little bit hot from that 100 proof. The Cognac is bringing in some body and a little bit more barrel notes. The Benedictine is adding some sweetness and botanicals, and then you have the botanicals of the Chartreuse kind of combining together to make something that is just really nice sort of nightcap cocktail. And it's a little bit high proof for a nightcap cocktail, but this is the flavor profile that I wanna end my dinner with or end my night with. So there it is, the Widow's Kiss. Ugh. Apparently we're doing outros with the cocktails again, so that's what we're doing today. Okay, hope you liked these cocktails. I don't know how many people are gonna actually watch this video and make the cocktails, but but if you don't make the cocktails, you're doing yourself a disservice because these are three fantastic cocktails, all of which are not really uh, mentioned that much. They are all legendary in one way or another, but they are not that popular. So hey, help me out, drink the cocktails, let's make them more popular.